And joining the table, Republican presidential candidate and Texas Congressman Ron Paul. Good to have you on the show, yep. sir. And Pulitzer Prize winning associate editor of the Washington Post, Bob Woodward. Good to see you. We were at Chris Matthews' party last night, and yep. Bob gave us the topics. He gave us the topics. Yes. <laughs> he said, you know, it's the opposite. Of usually the, the shows call you up and say, these are the things you're going to talk about exactly. for three minutes here. And the there's a little questions. framework of questions put together we by don't a 23 year old. We do that producer. here. We just sort of wake up and say, look at the papers and say, look. But Bob last night was ready. He and has. We were laser focused. Laser focused. On the super committee. So <laughs> this is a perfect match up here because here we've got Ron Paul. We brought him for you. A guy Thank who you. has <laughs> been, been warning about the debt. And Ron, let's start before we talk about America's debt. Let's start with Greece's debt. Looks like a deal was made. Now the Greeks seem to be rebelling against it once again, proving they don't want to live within their means. What's it mean for the rest of us? We all face the same problem. Nobody wants to admit the truth. <laughs> the, the world is bankrupt. The system is bankrupt. It's not viable. And we're facing the same consequences because we've spent way beyond our means mm -hmm. and uh, nobody wants to cut a nickel. I mean, all this talk is just talk. Uh, there aren't any cuts. Even the proposed cuts are cuts in the future, five, ten years out. So uh, I, I think that if you live beyond your means, you have to live within your means. That means you have to cut back. And that's not acceptable because there's too many people have become too dependent, and they've been taught for many, many decades that uh, deficits really don't more. matter. Deficits yeah. don't matter. And this Keynesian idea that uh, it's always the consumer that drives the economy, which I don't buy into, which means that the demand is that the consumers spend more money to stimulate the economy. Well, they're broke and they don't have jobs and they're, uh, you know, they have too many credit cards. So that, that can't be the solution. You know, Bob, the, the, the problem is this. Even if the super committee were to succeed by the low standards that we all have set for it, cutting $4 trillion. Now, a decade ago, $4 trillion, that would have been significant. Now $4 trillion doesn't even pay for what we've spent over the last four years. And, and they aren't even going to go there. And they're not going to even go there. I mean, they're talking about $1.2 trillion, as the congressman points out, over 10 years. So that's maybe $100 billion a year. And you get into the weeds on some of this, which I'm, I'm trying to do to answer the question, how is the economy being managed and what is the nature of the jeopardy we're in? If, take something, you remember this from your days in Congress, f farm subsidies. Okay, they talk and they say, we can cut $29 billion in farm subsidies. And the Republicans say, okay, uh, that's a great idea, let's do it. And then the White House comes in and says, no, let's only cut farm subsidies 2% of that for rich farmers. And so you're, you're talking night and day, and they are not together on this. And you go through item after item, and uh, it, it gets blown up, and they don't agree on even the small bites. You know, one and a half trillion dollars, if that's what they're talking about cutting, Ron, over a, a decade is such a joke considering that last Christmas, the president and the Republican Congress agreed to a plan that raised the deficit immediately, or the national debt, by an additional trillion dollars. No, nope, nobody is serious on Capitol Hill. I mean, I, I, who is? What's happened? Well, I don't think you can accuse me of not being serious. Well, when I say <laughs> when I say nobody's serious, because I I think it, it's a, a very very broad I think it's struggle. so dangerous and so bad, and we're facing something the world has never faced before. That my token effort to start off with would be to cut a trillion dollars in one year of real cuts, and uh, I, I think it would be helpful. And I argue this because of uh, what we did after World War II. We cut <clears throat> spending sixty percent and cut taxes thirty percent, and we sent ten million million people into the workforce. And guess what? It ended, finally ended the Depression. People went back to work again because the changes occurred, the debt had been liquidated, and we were ready to go back to work again. So you just can't solve the problem of spending and debt with more spending and debt and printing of money. It's absurd, and they are not changing their mind. And the it. word that's not being used here, which is the word in uh, Greece, Austerity, mm -hmm. and here everyone's talking about. Oh, this is a this is a manageable. It's like they talk about Iraq and Afghanistan and say hard but not hopeless. 
Uh, but when you again go to the numbers time and time again there is not agreement on the smallest things now I think the campaign next year is going to get down to presidential leadership can you manage the economy does somebody have their hands on the steering wheel and I think the, the sense people have now is uh, there are no hands or 20 hands on the steering wheel and somebody's got to come up and say this is the plan let's face so, it and you know the public voters are not going to like the word austerity but that's where we're headed I, I don't disagree with you at all Sam Stein I wonder though if that person whoever that person is who has to say that has to also say we are not going to get back to where we were that this is going to be a long process and that unemployment is going to last probably this long or this long and this is what we're going to have to do to reboot who has the guts to say that that there's not a lot of hope in our current situation well, of rectifying it to back before the bubble burst i would argue that and to a certain extent and he's been criticized for it president obama has gone out and said you know this I is going to be a long you. slog yeah. and that the economy that we once had which was manufacturing based largely is not going to be the economy that we have in the future. Let me just add a few data points to this because I think it's worthwhile to note that in addition to the $1.2 trillion that the Super Committee wants to cut, they did achieve about $900 to a $1 trillion in cuts as part of the debt ceiling deal in August. And in addition to that, there is supposed to be, now we have to wait and see for this, another $1 trillion in savings from drawing down the war. Those still don't get to the crux of the matter, which is we have a huge rising health care cost, pr predominantly health care cost problem in this country. But one of the ways to solve it is not simply just to cut, which is valid, but to get people back to work so that we can actually increase the tax base in this country. And one of the questions is, how do you get people back to work? And do, does government play a role? Now, I know where you stand on that. Government probably should not play a role. But I'm wondering, in the interim, for you, would there be anything that you would be proud of or support the government actually doing to stimulate some job growth to actually expand the tax base? Well, the government does have a role. They ought to give us sound money. They ought to give us market interest rates. They ought to let us spend the money. I don't talk in terms of austerity and sacrifice because I tell the people I, I visit with that uh, it's not a sacrifice for you to get your freedom back and get the market back and get you to keep your money and get you to get to spend the money. The people who have to sacrifice and give up are the people who have been living off the government and living off the taxpayers. They don't need any more bailouts. So it's not a sacrifice who want, for the, the people who want to take care of themselves. what can the government do between now and, let's say, three months to maybe get some job growth? Is there anything that the government can the do? The only thing you can do is to show the people that you're going to change the direction of the country. But it's not a budgetary problem. It is a philosophy problem. You can't cut, uh, you can't cut nickels and dimes from the militarism and the military budget unless you change the foreign policy. Yeah. You can't change, you can't cut entitlements unless you give up on the principle of entitlement. So we have to decide whether we want to live within the confines of the Constitution but, but no or we want to continue to do what we've been doing, which means that the pie is shrinking and the demands are growing and the anger is increasing. But, but, but no one really wants to bite the bullet on this. I mean, you're talking numbers, uh, 900 billion or 1 trillion cut here and so forth. And if you really follow the numbers and get beyond the smoke and mirrors, a lot of those numbers are rounding errors. I mean, we now have an annual deficit of $1.6 trillion. That's in one year. And if you go out and say, well, let's cut a little less than that in 10 years. Come on. Well, those budgets are rounding errors. Those were, caps. Right those were budget caps that were set, not rounding yeah. errors. So, so, Ron, it seems to me that this is your time. This should be your time as a presidential candidate. You know, I've been talking about deficits and the debt since 1994, and I've been talking about it nonstop. But you were talking about it before I came to Congress. You have talked about it after I left Congress. You've been talking about this for 20, 25 years. I always go back to your quote. It was actually in September of 2003 when you predicted. It's frightening, Bob. He predicted exactly what was going to happen with Fannie and Freddie and the banks. He said this is going to create a housing bubble. It's going to be a housing bubble that's going to spread a virus through the entire economy, across the entire world. And when it pops, we're in big trouble. So you've been predicting this coming debt crisis. <clears throat> what are people telling you out on the campaign trail? 
Well, the people I talked to the other day, I had 1,200 people come out of the University of Iowa, and they were enthusiastic Amazing. about it. So, uh, no, I, I just think that time has changed. You say, well, if this is true and they're coming my way, why am I not on the top? But tell you what, we have a solid base. The country has changed dramatically different. I can compare to four years ago. Just think of, You're sensing just, it on the campaign right, trail. It's just, think of, just think of the success with the Federal Reserve. Bernanke has to go before the people at press conferences. I mean, they're on the defensive now. 65% of the American people say, we need to know how they're passing out this credit. $15 trillion worth of credit, they deal with They're bigger than the Congress. $5 trillion went to foreigners. Bob, Bob, you're all about transparency. And you know, Ron has obviously been focused on the Fed for a very long time. It is extraordinary the power that federal chairmen have behind closed doors. How did we get to a position where one of the most powerful people in the world is able to act, I won't say with impunity, but certainly without the most basic democratic checks. Well, I mean, it, it's it's all about money and following that money. By the way, the by the way does that money. bother you? That Does that, that arrangement where the Fed chief has... Uh, so much power and they work, well, it, work it, in it, secret? It, it, it certainly, I, I mean, but there's more and more transparency, as we know, and right now there's not much they can do because we effectively have zero interest rates. So their lever <laughs> is going, work. as you, as you well working. know. So in a, in a sense, they're reduced to pronouncements and press conferences and uh, quantitative easing and so forth, which is, you know, it, is, is something that's not the old interest rate lever, which really has an impact or can have an impact on the economy. So, Congressman, why is Herman Cain at the top of the polls? I, I think he's gotten, uh, you know, some b very big boosts. You know, the week where he really soared, yeah. he won a straw vote in Florida, mm -hmm. and, that, and he was on the news constantly, and this story, oh, wow, look at that. That same week, I won the straw vote in California. Yeah. Zero coverage. Why is that? I, I think I'm attacking the status quo like never before. I mean, the whole entitlement system, and I think there's a lot more support out there for what I'm talking about than they realize, and they're not going to give me a boost because I'm challenging the whole banking system, the military-industrial complex, the welfare state, our foreign policy. I want to go back to following strictly the Constitution. It's not in the cards right now except the growing number of people. Are, are, is very significant. So the movement is in our direction because of this failure. You talk about the failure of the Fed. This this is significant. They don't have any cards left to play. This whole economy has no cards left to play. So this this is going to be reversed. Just so, as communism so went the in the dog. So are you candidate of austerity? Are you going out uh, Well, I don't use that word. I'm the candidate of liberty where people have energy and incentives. But to get and, you know, there, we're, we're going to have a real long drought no, no, of it, austerity, are no, we? The, the no, the record shows that when you do, it only takes about a year. 1921 depression, you should look at, as well as what my example was of World War II. We cut it in a year, everybody was back to work. 10 million people, 60% cut the deficit. You don't want to have a campaign slogan, Midnight in America. You want to talk yeah, about but, but the, the people that come to my rallies are enthusiastic. They say this is the most positive thing we ever heard. You know why? Because we're admitting the truth and saying there's something seriously wrong. We have to make difference. Because if, you, if you're in total denial and we continue to lie to ourselves, there's no hope. It's sort of like getting better from cancer and not admitting you have it and, and taking the medication. Mm -hmm. But the medication isn't nearly as bad as they'd like to paint it to be. So, it's not yeah. sacrifice. So let, let, not let, sacrifice. Let, let's go from budget to Afghanistan, something we talk about around this table all yeah. the time. Bob, you've, you've talked about it a good bit. Congressman, obviously, you've been very concerned for a very long time right. with America's ever-expanding <clears throat> military state. Um, the White House is now talking about looking into, looking into possibly drawing down in Afghanistan quicker. Uh, could, you, could you explain uh, why we are still in Afghanistan after a decade? No, no sane reason for us to be there. And this drawing down in Iraq is a complete farce. They're not drawing down. I mean, we, we have an embassy there, the biggest in the world. It's a fortress. 17,000 people are going to be. They're going to be contractors. We may take a few troops out and spread them around. They're going to put more troops in Kuwait. We are not 
vacating anything. And for, as long as we're there, yeah. as, so, yeah. as long as we're there, believe me, there is going to be incentive to kill us. Can I ask you something on that? Because I've been to a bunch of your speeches on the trail, and usually when you get to the foreign policy section of your speech, you'll see half the crowd cheer, cheer you wildly. They go nuts, and then you see the other half of the crowd start booing. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about Republican politics with respect to foreign policy specifically, and look at the past Very 10 years. Very convoluted. Look at the past 10 years, and starting with the rise of the neoconservative wing, and where the Republican Party stands now as a unit with respect to foreign policy. I think what you're saying is a strictly Republican meeting. You know, half yeah, yeah, half yeah. I'm one. talking about like but, a seat. But if I go to a campus, it's 95 percent. These young people who are bearing the burden, inheriting the debt, and have to fight these wars, and the military. Guess what? You know, I get more money yeah, from yeah. active military duty, twice as much as all the other candidates. They're sick and tired of it. So my. Did you know that, Bob? In, in the 08 yeah. campaign, and this while, while you have neocons uh, trashing Ron Paul because he's saying bring the troops home, <laughs> in the last campaign and in this campaign, military members and their families gave easily more to Ron than anybody else because they understand the strain better than some politician or somebody in a think tank in Washington, D.C., that this is putting. It is a readiness issue. We're stretching. And it, 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 it's it is. expanding, and, and, ever but, expanding. But, but at the same time, I, mean, I think you have to give credit to President Obama on this. He is drawing down. Now, the question is, and lots of uh, other Republicans say he may be doing that too fast yes. in Iraq, <laughs> that he needs some troops there is an insurance policy. And there's a certain rationale there. But uh, the White House is on the Pentagon on spending, on getting troops out of Afghanistan and Iraq. But you're right, Joe. We're not taking the flag down. We're not and no, no president wants we to. We are spending None of it is that $2 easy billion dollars a week in Afghanistan. And you talk about co college campuses. I have yet to find people outside of Washington, D.C., Ron, that thinks it makes sense for us to spend $2 billion a week in Afghanistan a decade later. No, it absolutely makes no sense. And uh, there's no money. I mean, we're in this huge deficit. If we can't cut the occupation of these countries, there's no hope for us. Let me tell you, there's just no hope for us. We better be willing to do it. We have to change the policy. If the design is to police the world and nation build and satisfy everybody's borderlines, believe me, we're doomed because we're doing exactly what the Soviets did. We need to change our attitude, take care of our people at home. How do you get medical care at home if you're spending all this money bombing people and then rebuilding their countries? It's insane. Well, right. and the rationale for staying in Afghanistan is to keep al-Qaeda from coming back into Afghanistan. And, and as we know, uh, al-Qaeda has had a bad couple of years. They and uh, they are going back into Afghanistan. But they're in Iraq now. They weren't there when we went to war. So we're only and, giving and the incentive for the al-Qaeda. Congressman Ron Paul, very good to have you on the side. Please come back. Thank you, Ron. Great to see you. Thank ya. you. Good luck.